I'm going to talk to you about medical ultrasound and I'd like to start by uh, telling you two interesting facts. So first fact is that um, ultrasound is the fastest, cheapest and safest diagnostic tool in medicine. And the second fact is there are estimated to be about 50 million medical practitioners in the world and only a tiny fraction of those have the ability to use or have access to ultrasound, which is, I've just said, is one of the safest diagnostic tools in medicine. So I work for a company called Intelligent Ultrasound. We're an AIM-listed company. We were formerly known as Metaphor, uh, and our aim is to change uh, uh, the whole uh, market for ultrasound and enable more people to be able to use ultrasound and scan faster and better with this fabulous diagnostic tool. So a few slides will hopefully show you that we're actually entering one of the most exciting times for the company over the last couple of years. And as I've said, ultrasound is um, a great diagnostic tool. And there's a number of market indicators that are supporting why that's going to remain the case for the next decade. So importantly, the cost and size of ultrasound continues to reduce dramatically. If you look at uh, the device here, this is what most people would think of uh, when they think of ultrasound. Uh, going into hospital, uh, pregnancy at 12 weeks, and they're going to get their first scan. And they see that fetus for the first time on an ultrasound screen and get a picture taken of it. These devices, large, would be ro rolled into the room, but the devices have come down dramatically in size. And this device here is the latest generation of ultrasound. It's from a company called Butterfly. Uh, they were valued, I think, just before Christmas at something like $1 billion. They raised $250 million to commercialize their technology, and their technology plugs into your phone. So they take ultrasound, it plugs into the phone, and their aim is to become the first company that really gives every doctor ultrasound and <coughs> replaces the, the stethoscope. Uh, they become the stethoscope of the future. Now, the interesting thing about this technology is that actually at $2,000 a unit, everyone is openly talking about how this can become the sort of $100 device that you plug into your own phone and then you scan yourself at home. And that could dramatically change ultrasound, obviously moving it from being a professional tool to a device that actually could be used by anyone around the world. So that is happening now and is a key indicator. The second indicator is that actually ultrasound is used in almost every speciality within medicine. So no longer is it just for ultra, um, obstetrics, it's now used on vascular, you scan your carotid artery to do a stroke risk assessment, you scan your liver, your kidney, your heart, uh, Vascular for veins, uh, DVT if you've been on a flight, everywhere ultrasound is used in medicine. So very importantly, the two key indicators are this is a growth market. However, it's a difficult skill to use. Ultimately, ultrasound still requires an operator to control the ultrasound device and get a good image. So you've got to learn that skill, and that's a hard skill both to learn and to stay in practice. And then finally, um, the reality is that um, supply is outstripping demand at the moment in terms of um, we've got uh, not enough clinicians and too many patients wanting to use ultrasound and this is where we see uh, AI, artificial intelligence, is expected to meet this gap. So artificial intelligence is hoped for over the next decade that tools and software devices will be able to use artificial intelligence to enable more doctors to see more patients. And medical imaging is one of the big areas that we're expecting to see growth. And it's forecast that um, this market could be worth about $3 billion over the next decade. Uh, this, this data comes from Accenture. And we estimate that the ultrasound market could be about $1 billion of that. So all the indicators are this is a good market to be in. And that is one of the reasons why, as a business, we um, expanded from just being a simulation business that taught ultrasound in the classroom and acquired a uh, spin-out company from the University of Oxford 18 months ago that delivered us uh, a set of early stage AI-based software tools for ultrasound. And that is enabling us, sorry, that, that is enabling us to basically 
follow the doctor from the classroom where we teach them how to do ultrasound and enabling us to provide AI-based uh, software tools that will enable um, real-time image analysis to happen on the ultrasound machines themselves and for us to be able to support doctors and uh, less skilled um, <coughs> sonographers or clinicians or necessarily midwives who want to use scanning tools and we will give AI software tools that will support that. And these tools are planned to be embedded in the ultrasound machines themselves. So we're now a business that consists of two divisions. The first division is the simulation business, this one, and the second one is the clinical division, and I'll talk about them separately. So the simulation business is based in uh, Cardiff and Atlanta in the US, and this is our revenue-based uh, business, uh, the business that was formerly known as Metaphor, and We've just announced our results uh, in March, and we turned over about 5.3 million uh, revenue from the business, uh, which was about a 27% increase. The analysts are forecasting that we should be able to keep that growth going. So sort of solid growth over the last three, four years. And that's based on our three gold standard simulators that we have in the marketplace. So the first of those is Scan Trainer, which you can see here. So Scan Trainer is a virtual reality haptic feedback device that teaches doctors how to scan. Um, think of it like a, um, in aviation, a pilot goes into an uh, aircraft simulator to learn how to fly a plane. Well, in this case, a doctor goes, in, goes onto one of our simulators and it simulates the patient and it simulates all the different pathologies and all the different teaching tools so you can properly assess and teach a doctor and then assess them at the end of it and tell them that they're competent enough to scan on a patient. And the first of our products was called Scan Trainer, which teaches that in obstetrics. We then have a product called HeartWorks, which does the same thing but teaches uh, heart and lung scanning. And then finally, we have a new product called BodyWorks, which is an ultra-realistic female mannequin. And this is all about teaching um, POCUS, which is um, point-of-care ultrasound. It's the new area of ultrasound. Uh, there's a lot of requirement for teaching it within the medical world. So it's emergency medicine, critical care, intensive care ultrasound. And they are our three simulators that we believe will keep that growth going over the next few years. So we currently sell those products um, in the UK, North America, and the rest of the world. They're the three regions in terms of how we've divided the market up. Uh, in the UK, which is our original home market, we sell about a million uh, pounds worth of sales in there. That makes about 20% of our, our market. Um, in the US, we have our own direct sales team. Uh, they make about 30% of the market up, and they were just under 2 million sales last year. We're expecting significant growth to come from the US this year because of the BodyWorks platform. And then in the rest of the world, which last year made up half our sales, um, we sell through a uh, reseller network of about 30 distributors. Um, so we're pretty much an export-led business, and we think, believe that will continue to grow over the next couple of years, mainly because there's still a lot of market potential out there. We've sold about 700 of our simulators into about 400 institutions around the world. And if you look at our original market, which is the UK, we think we've reached about a 40% market penetration in our first product, which was Scan Trainer, and Heartworks is about 20%. Bodyworks, obviously, because we've only just launched it, has the whole market to go after. Um, but if you compare that figure to the US, where actually we think we're only at a 10 to 12% market penetration. There's clearly huge potential in the US and likewise in the rest of the world for the simulation division. So the other division, the, uh, I guess the exciting new area of a business, is the clinical division. And that is based in Oxford. We have an office uh, just outside Didcot. Um, and that's where our clinical team is um, basically working on all our deep learning algorithms that are all about how can you analyze ultrasound images real time so that you can give live guidance to sonographers and doctors as they scan a patient in the clinic, okay? So everything I've just been talking about is all about teaching someone how to scan. I'm now talking about the clinical side where we actually follow the doctor into the clinic where they're scanning live on a patient and we use our algorithms, our software to basically improve how they scan and I'll explain what that means. So um, if, why, why is AI of interest in medical imaging? Well, 
There are a number of reasons, and the first big area, of course, is X-ray, CT scanning, and MRI. Now, these are mainly when you, if anyone's had any of these scans, you'll know that you, that you follow a pretty much a set procedure for um, being scanned, and that means you get, it's a common replicable procedure, um, it gives you a consistent image set. So, no, so pretty much no matter who's operating it, you're going to get a consistent set of uh, images from which to then send to the radiologist to diagnose. So from a perspective of where can AI help with that, well, it's all about helping with that diagnosis, okay? It's about supporting image review and identifying where there's any pathologies or any issues within the images. Ultrasound is different, and ultrasound is different because it is very much a real-time interactive scan. So the images that are captured totally depend on the sonographer or doctor's capability, okay? Um, and then, obviously, once they have those images, then it's all about diagnosis. And that means that AI, artificial intelligence, has the ability to help both at the scanning stage in terms of helping a doctor obtain a good image um, and also helping speed up their workflow, because it's actually very important to try and enable people to scan faster, as we've already talked about. If you can get 20 people scanned a day rather than 10, that makes a big difference to a scanning centre. Um, and then also then be able to help with the diagnosis. So AI has a real role to play in ultrasound, but it is the hardest area to do it because it is such a real-time scanning environment led by the operator. So we have a technology called ScanNav. So ScanNav is basically focused almost at the moment entirely in obstetrics. We are looking at how we can help with the scanning process where there's a protocol to follow. So in obstetrics, you follow a protocol. If you go in at 12 weeks, 20 weeks, or 30 weeks in the pregnancy, um, the sonographer has to follow a process. So that protocol will be about identifying the key images you've got to select for the key parts of the anatomy you're looking at. This is focused, ScanNav is focused on the 20-week scan. And the 20-week scan in the UK, you've got to take all the key parts of the anatomy to check there's no abnormalities, okay? Because all the, the baby has grown enough now to check there's nothing wrong with it. So you want to check the head in two views, you want to look at the heart to see all the chambers, you want to see the stomach, the femur length, etc. And there's a whole protocol that's written to that, and every one of those images that you take has to follow and meet a set criteria, and that is that it's not just that you've got a head, but it means that you've got all the key elements of the head. If you're looking at the abdomen, for example, you must be able to see the stomach, the umbilical cord, uh, you must be able to see the ribs on both sides and the spine. And if you can see all those structures within that image, that's considered a good enough image to diagnose from. If you're slightly out of plane in the view, and you can't see two of them, then you might miss that there's an abnormality there, and then you'll have a problem when the baby's delivered. So our software basically aims to, has mapped every single one of those structures and identified every single one of the substructures that you have to see according to the protocol. In the UK, it's called FASP. In America, it's called ACR. And the global standard is called ISHWOG. And our software is being mapped to meet all those standards. It's been trained on 350,000 images. So every single one of these images from the UK hospitals have been graded and sorted and used to teach our algorithm how to see and identify a structure. And that software is then loaded into the ultrasound machine itself. And so when the sonographer is scanning and they freeze the image, say, right, is that a good stomach? I think I've got a good stomach view. They freeze the image. And the system automatically, in real time, checks that image that they've taken, knows what it's looking for in the substructure, and says, can I see them? and then gives a tick back saying, yes, I can see those images. That's good enough to scan for. Now, that happened in about two seconds. It happens in a fraction of a second. It happens real time as the doctor's scanning. And I'm going to show you it working live. It's been piloted because it's CE marked in the UK. It has been piloted in two hospitals, one St George's in London and the IUH in Bath. Um, they were mainly picked because they've got good operational um, scanning um, departments who are also happy to take new product on and give feedback on it in a live working environment. But also, importantly, they, were both, they both run different ultrasound machines. So St George's runs GE machines and uh, Bath runs Toshiba machines. And it means you can check there's no difference between the two. So this is it working live. We believe this, this is a world first. There's no one else has done this in the world showing real time live assessment of the images as they're scanned. So, the, the screen is, this is called ScanNav Audit. It's live, here's the doctor scanning. There's three components. You've got the image, they keep moving around. So that's the doctor scanning, that's the image. He's looking there to, at the face, and can he see the different 
uh, the nasal tip, the nostrils, the upper lip, and is it magnified properly? When it's green and they're all correct, it basically says yes, populates the screen and gives him a tick. So on the spine, he's now span scanning the spine. Can you see the spine? You can do a composite view here, and you can see, if you can see the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral, you can get four images of each and put them together. Here you can see the cervical and thoracic. He's got the other two. It's going to give him a green light to say, you've covered all four now. Green light on the spine, that image is good enough to view. Here he's looking at the head. This is the baby's head. He's going to freeze the image. Everything's fine, except he can't see the CSP, so it's going to have to take another picture because you've got to see all of them. So he's moved the probe, taken another picture. It'll come down here. He gets a tick saying that's all OK. So now put the calipers on. They'll go green when they're in the right place and immediately then fill the box and say he's got a good image. So this is real-time, live guidance and support. It's exactly the same as a senior doctor standing beside the sonographer saying, yep, that's a good enough image. Save it. So the benefit of that is you get 100% audit of all scans. It means every scan you know has been done to a certain standard. Uh, you've saved all the images, and you've got all the key elements of those images. And it's also a really good support for doctors and sonographers who are in the early stages of scanning or maybe not quite so confident to scan without someone else with them. So that is a, the, what I would call a, the good f a starting point, great starting point. But you still rely on the doctor to actually get the right image and freeze that image and save it. So the, the feedback was, that'd be great, but can you actually make it live real time? So instead of me having to freeze the image, can you get it so that actually, as I move the probe around, the system analyzes every, every image that's being bounced back by the ultrasound, including the ones that I'm not necessarily seeing. As I move a probe across the pa patient, I then slow it down and I'll see an image. But as I've moved, there might have been 15 different images that I've taken, and one of those might well be a really good view of the femur that I didn't even realize I'd taken. So could it automatically recognize every image and save it automatically? So that's called ScanNav Auto Capture. And this is that product working live on a patient. It's in our scanning room because it's not CE marked yet. But this sonographer here, scanning live, she's not touching the machine. And the system is automatically reviewing every slice of the ultrasound. And if it sees a good image, saves it. So here. This is the head. Does it see everything? It'll automatically start populating all the images and filling them all in and saving all those images. Now, that's potentially a major time saver when you're scanning. In America, you have to scan, uh, you have to get 23 images. So in the UK, it's seven. In America, it's 23. They cover off everything. So, and I think in the global standard is the same, 23 or 24. So if you imagine you're in a very busy scanning room, you've got to scan a patient. It's a very important scan for the patient to get everything right, but you've got to save all 23 images. You've got to remember which ones you've done, which ones you haven't done. This system would have all 23 listed to the side. They'd all start going green as you move the probe and it captures them without you having to save it. So it's estimated by doctors and sonographers this could save you maybe 20, 25% of scanning time. We were at uh, one of the big radiology shows in America and Chicago in November. And all the diagnostic centers that came to visit said that would be fantastic for us. Now, that sort of feedback is important because it means that a hospital would pay for it. Because ultimately, it doesn't matter how good anything is, ultimately, will someone get their checkbook out and buy your product? And the early indications are that this product um, is, meets the needs that sonographers and doctors have actually to work in an operation environment. The two lead sonographers from Bath and uh, London all came back and said, actually, this really helps us. We were skeptical at first. You know, everyone's a little bit afraid that AI is going to take their job. But actually, this was, a, this was an aid to us. It wasn't taking our job. It was just helping us scan better and scan faster. And that's exactly we, what we want in an operational scanning live environment. So very, very positive feedback. Um, importantly, um, that sort of feedback is important from a manufacturer's perspective, because ultimately our product has to go on the ultrasound machines themselves. This is not a device that you plug into the side of any ultrasound machine. This will have to be embedded in future ultrasound machines. So we are talking to all the big manufacturers at the moment about having our product embedded within their machines. We hope that we will sign a deal this year with one of the major manufacturers, and that will enable us to put the product into regulatory approval in the US and the U um, Europe uh, before the end of the year and have our first product into market in the second half of next year. So 
It's an exciting time for what we believe is a world's first in the area of obstetrics ultrasound scanning. So that's our first product line in this new AI division. The second product line is something called Anatomy Guide. It's similar technology, doing similar thing, but in a different area. So it's a, it's a different development team. We're here talking about ultrasound guided needling. So ultrasound guided needling, I'm conscious I've only got a minute, but um, ultrasound guided needling is all about can you use uh, an ultrasound machine to guide the needle in. And we focused on something called peripheral nerve block. Peripheral nerve blocks where you actually do a local anaesthetic to try and avoid the need to have a general anaesthetic, saving a hospital time and money and a patient the risk. And the product does the same thing. It's been taught to look for the key parts of anatomy. It's been taught on lots of images and I'll show you it working live. So this is anatomy guide working on the adductor canal. This is the doctor scanning. Here is the image they would see normally showing you a grayscale ultrasound. Here is ScanNav highlighting the key structures automatically in real time for them. The yellow is the target area, the red is the artery they want to avoid, the green is the muscle. And the idea is that it will enable anaesthetists who are not necessarily known to be good scanners and give them the confidence to be able to scan without having to have a second person scanning next to them. Now again, this is a device that is on the same uh, delivery pathway of having this in regulatory pathway by the end of the year and into product next year. We are again talking to major manufacturers about embedding this into their machines and bringing it to market. Um, the future, the natural extension of this is something called uh, ScanNav Assist. And this is if you can identify structures, well, then you can identify abnormality. So here, this is the, I can see on a kidney, it's showing a hydrophonosis abnormality within the kidney, recognizing as you scan. Um, the second one is going to then show a renal calculus, which is harder to see, and you'll see it coming up in a second. That there is a little tiny red dot. It's a renal calculus. It's quite easy to miss when you're scanning. And the idea is that we develop pathology-related tools that identify key uh, pathologies as you scan, and it would make it harder for a sonographer or doctor to miss a pathology as they're <coughs> scanning. Um, the final area that we're looking at is that if and when the hardware does get down to the $100 device where anyone can scan using their own phone, is having the ability of using our software tools to enable you to scan at home. So that either you'd be scanning linked to a doctor remotely and you'd be able to scan without having to go into a GP surgery. They would then see the results live over the cloud or having automated health checkers built into your phone so you could scan your carotid artery and it would give you a health risk assessment on stroke or a health risk assessment on your liver. We think that is the future, but we think it's probably five, 10 years away. And what we hope is that our software tools that we were developing for the professionals will have a direct relevance to the consumer market as and when that happens. So in summary, we, are, uh, we have a simulation division, turned over 5.3 million, has the gold standard in teaching uh, and uh, doctors through simulation. And this very exciting new part of our business, which is the clinical division, which has got four products in development, three of which were at uh, commercial agreement stage, where we're looking to sign agreements this year for these three products to bring them into the marketplace and bring us revenue in 2020, 2021 <coughs> onwards. And for me, it's a very exciting time to be part of the company. Hopefully, I've conveyed some of that to you now. Um, but uh, I look forward to answering any questions you want, either here or in the room afterwards. Thank you. That's terrific. Thank you very much indeed, Stuart. Do you have any questions for Stuart? Please? If so, I've got um, a couple to, to kick us off. Um, coming back to um, the, the, the first part of business, on the breakdown of sales of yeah. the uh, simulators, yeah. I noticed your... Um, USA and rest of the world, you were selling more of the Heartworks product, product by market penetration. Yeah. Whereas in the UK, it was more like the scan trainer. Yes. Um, any reason for that? Is it, is it opportunities uh, well, different think, overseas? The UK has sort of led the world in teaching ultrasound through simulation. And a big focus of that was in Obzengaini. And so the, uh, the standard, which is called FASP, um, any tool that can help teach that and make <coughs> basically the UK better as a, as a medical system in terms of identifying 
um, weather issues in that 20-week scan. There was a big push to actually improve scanning um, through simulation in the UK, and we've sort of led the way on that. And our simulator was seen as being the best on the marketplace, which is why we've sold so many in the UK. Um, I think American reality is catching up on that, so that's why we're seeing America now sort of following the UK in terms of how they use high-fidelity simulation to teach, because ultimately, if your job depends on being very good at scanning, which if you're a sonographer it is, you want the best simulator to teach you. And ours is considered to be the best simulator in the market. And, and maybe slightly anecdotal, the, 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 kind of the current levels of accuracy among sonographers, say in the UK, yeah. and most people probably have most of their experience um, with ultrasound in, in obstetrics, those, those, those scans 20 weeks, 12 weeks. Mm. And from personal experience, you can have a scan one day and be told one measurement for, a fee, uh, for, 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 for any of the measurements, then the next day it's completely different, and it's different again, different again, different again. Is there much, um, do you think, clinical need for greater accuracy? Uh, okay. So I would say that th there is always a variation. Mm. If, you, if you gave the same image to four doctors, they'd probably look at it and say something slightly different. Generally, though, the, the whole point of the standard is to make sure that actually we do start to standardise and the scanning level is consistent. Um, if you're having a baby's age measured, it should be consistent. So you might be a day or two out from you know, tiny marginal differences, but it shouldn't be a week or two out. So generally, yes, the important thing is to make sure that actually the quality of scanning, wherever it's done, under whatever time pressure, is, is good. Now, we actually tend to get quite a lot of, you know, we're not bad with the amount of time that we get to scan. In someone, China has a lot of pressure on scanning. They have to scan a lot of patients very quickly. And so any device that can help improve the accuracy, guarantee that you're going to scan to a certain standard, is considered to have a lot of market potential. Any other questions for Stuart, please? Turn up in here. Hi. Where's one moment? Thank you. Do you have a competition? Uh, so, well, on the simulation side, yes. On the AI side, I think there's, all, there's, there's a lot of people investing a lot of money in artificial intelligence. <coughs> we appear to be in an area of the marketplace where we've got an advantage, mainly because the company that we acquired from the University of Oxford, the research was done by one of the, the world's leading academics in this space. She's called Alison Noble, Professor Alison Noble. She's a fellow of the Royal Society. She's considered to be a world leader in um, machine learning based image analysis in, in ultrasound. And because it's the hardest one, most of the competition appear to have been focusing on CT and X-ray um, imaging and doing post uh, post-clinical analysis, so identifying lots of different scans in the, uh, in, the, in the diagnostic element, not in the live scanning element. And we, we appear to be right at the forefront of that at the moment. So hopefully our aim is to stay at the forefront, get our first products out there, and become known as the world leader in ultrasound AI. One more question. When are you going to make profit? Give us a yeah, that's the, uh, it was a difficult one. That I can't actually answer that because I'm not allowed to give a profit forecast. But obviously, our aim as a business is that we've got two sides of the business. One is to make sure that try and make the simulation business get that to break even. So the simulation business is at a break even level. Now, I would say we're relatively close at that. If you just have to look at our numbers, and we can talk about that afterwards. We're close um, or getting closer. Uh, the the AI side does need investment. But I think what's interesting is that sort of multi, we are looking at signing licensing deals that then give us revenue. The advantage of that is we don't have to do the selling. Once we've signed a license deal and it's on a machine manufacturer's device, and they will be, you know, hopefully the bigger companies in the marketplace who've already got the existing sales forces and the existing sales, that that will then deliver us revenue on an ongoing multi-layered approach over the next two, three, four years' time. So I think that... Yes, we're certainly not going to make a profit next year, but after that you'll start to see revenue coming in from the clinical side, which should accelerate us getting to that point which everyone wants, which is we don't have to raise money anymore, we just make money. A, a quick question. How, how many manufacturers are there? How many OEMs? So there's, a, there's about five, five or six big ones. Yeah. Um, you've got the Siemens, GE, Philips, uh, Samsung, um, probably missed one of those out. Oh, sorry, Toshiba Canon, and then uh, Mindray in China. Are they, are they kind of even-ish market share? No, they vary dominance? by speciality. Okay. So in obstetrics, I think GE is considered to have the, be the, the dominant player. Uh, Canon Toshiba is very good in general medical. Uh, Sonosite, which is another one, is very good in emergency medicine. And then they'll have some regional variations. So to be honest, there's lots of opportunity for different licensing deals with different companies and different products. Lady here, please. Um, you mentioned this 
Can you hold the microphone? Sorry. Is that better? Yeah, there we are. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you mentioned about the seven points of reference in England, but the UK, the US, and probably the rest of the world, you said 23. Yes. Why have we only got seven? And what's the reason for well, that? Well, so I think this, the seven are still the key ones, OK? So you could probably maybe, you, you call it, could maybe call it 10 if you looked at some of the other elements of it, but the, the seven are still the seven key ones in America. And so, the, so the head, the heart, the stomach, the femur, they're all consistent, but in America, they also say you've got to look at all the digits, both feet, and so they just make that as a standardised, you have to do everything because they're concerned about being sued, I would guess. There's more pressure on you being you know, taken to court in America, so they tend to do every single view possible, whereas in the UK, we've said these are the seven key views. You'll still find that the hospitals are take, will take more images, but they are the seven key ones, but the seven key ones in the UK are still the... Those seven key ones will be in the seven, the 23 within the US. And you mentioned also that the, the new procedures which you're introducing are going to be embedded in old machines. Well, if you've got computers, you can't usually add... Yes, so the new... This, to it. So yeah. how practical is it? So this, this product is, is a going forward product. It will be... Generally, ultrasound machines tend to roll through in a sort of five to seven year cycle. So this will have to be on new product because it has to have better GPU processing power, graphics cards, et cetera, which the new machines do have. So on a go-forward basis, our aim is to be on machines going forward. There's a chance some of our products would work on a backwards compatibility basis, but that would be if they were more built as a black box that you plugged in. And at the moment, we're working on these being integrated in new machines going forward. One question, if I may, on, um, you mentioned litigation. If you, on, on, on the auto capture yeah. uh, uh, service, who, who has liability? If, if, well, if, if, if your software is given the green yeah. ticks. So, the, the soft, so ultimately, the user is in charge. So every single thing we do can be overridden. You can say, I reject it, or I accept it, or I overlay and put another um, image on there. All we're doing is giving you support. Okay. But ultimately, you are scanning the patient, and you are making the decision that you've finished and you are signing off everything. So we, are, we don't get involved in that. The new diagnostic ones, where you're picking up something, you're still, still again, you're giving a, we think this is something you need to look at further, but ultimately, we, it's not automated. You don't need to do anything. You don't need to be skilled. Now, how that will translate in 10, 15 years' time when you do something that's by a consumer-led, I'm doing this at home, I think there'll be discussions about how that works. And that's why I think you'll probably have the first stage is it's a stepping stone to the GP remotely mm -hmm. or the family practitioner remotely where you can scan and they can see it remotely. And then otherwise it might be more based on being sort of a checker rather than a health check rather than a I'm going to diagnose an illness. It will just be saying you would appear to be more at risk. Yeah, understood. Do you have any other questions? I've got a couple. We're running out of time. Gentlemen, here at the yellow tire, please. Are there any feel for how big the potential market is and what your market share might be? Yeah, so obviously at the moment the market is, is a completely new market. But if, so, for example, if you look at the, um, the ultrasound machine manufacturers market, there's about, <coughs> you think, between 20 and 30,000 ultrasound machines sold a year in the obstetrics market, for example. So uh, if our device was sold for $10,000 per machine, you can then work out how big that market is for the end sale we would then be but we wouldn't be taking that much we'd be selling ours to by license to a manufacturer so you'd be hoping to get a percentage of that we think it's a you know we certainly see that each product line has the potential for tens of millions of dollars of revenue per year per individual line so from a perspective of we're a business now currently turning over six million dollars anything that has the potential to be five to fifteen million dollars of revenue by product line obviously is a sort of game-changing type technology for us but we certainly think these markets are big enough to justify the investment and have the potential to grow considerably uh, one last one at the back you have one there chris yeah um, with regard to ongoing product development yeah what is your company's financial position yeah so we currently have about i think it's I mean, our published accounts is about just over four million pounds. Um, when we raised that money, we explained that that would last us till about the middle of next year. And so we would look to our current major institutional investors to carry on supporting us, at least for the next funding round. Um, 
So yes, but we will have to raise money, uh, and we have declared that in all our reporting accounts <coughs> and all our, our um, funding rounds to date. But I think it's a um, manageable and achievable amount of money that we would need to raise, because clearly at the moment, we, the key thing is getting agreements signed this year and getting product into regulatory pathway development. The regulatory side is actually not as um, foreboding as it sounds, because if you're going and doing that with a manufacturer, you're going onto an already approved machine and you're just making a modification to the regulatory approval of that software. So we think it's a very manageable and achievable pathway to having a product on a device sometime next year. And I think that's going to be the key from any future investment is showing movement along that pathway. Lovely. And you said you're going to be around for a drink afterwards? Yes. I think there's a couple more questions. I'll have to catch you after. Stuart, thank you very much indeed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.